In this Lenten season, we are rejoicing in knowing that we have been baptized into Christ's death, and we'll be exploring that more over the coming weeks in our midweek services. Tonight, we want to consider what baptism really is. What's the nature and substance of baptism? That it is a sacrament, not a sign. So let's review. What is a sacrament? Uh, maybe it's been a little while since confirmation for some of you. In our confirmation classes, we teach that a sacrament is a sacred act that is, first of all, instituted by God. It is something that God has given to us, that he wants us to do and to carry out. Secondly, God has attached a visible, earthly, tangible element to this act. And so obviously in baptism, that earthly element is water. Thirdly, most importantly, is that God attaches to a sacrament the forgiveness of sins. God delivers forgiveness to you and me through his sacraments to those who receive it. Now, of course, there are many people out there, people that you might know, love, maybe family members, neighbors, friends, that would completely disagree with you about the nature of baptism and how it is a sacrament. So many people out there look at baptism as if it's a, a symbolic thing, as if it's just a symbol for us to be reminded about how God spiritually washes us, as if it's nothing more than just some prop or cheap visual aid that God uses. Or maybe you've heard other people, as you've discussed baptism with, with, the, with them, maybe you've heard them say, oh, well, that's just normal water. What do you expect, that there's real power in there? There's nothing special in it. There's no real power in baptism. This is just a sign. It's a sign for us to show God our commitment, to show God our, our devotion, our love. It's, it's something that we do for God. But what a disservice this is to holy baptism, to have this kind of heart and attitude about God's great and powerful gift that he has given to you and me in baptism. If God has given us this gift, and if God has said it is important, it is valuable, it is filled with power, that it is needed, well then who are we to say otherwise? Who are we to say that it's just something that, that we are doing just to make God happy, that it's some good work that we are performing for him and for his sake? That way of thinking cheapens this great gift and treasure of baptism. It rips it away from God. And it says, no, this is something that, that belongs to us, not to you, Lord. This is something that we are doing for you. But that's all backwards. That kind of thinking gets, gets it all backwards. And in fact, it gets all of Christian theology backwards. Is our emphasis as Christians upon what we are supposed to do for God? Fact is that that way of thinking really applies to every other religion in the world. Every other world religion, it boils down to this, that you have to do something to appease whatever divine being, whatever God it is that you are following. In order for you to make him happy, in order for you to get into the afterlife, you have to jump through all of these hoops. You have to do all of these different things in order to earn it, in order to work your way into his favor and into his presence. But for you and me, we understand that's not the case. For us as Christians, we see that as being totally backwards, impossible for us to do. We admit that we could never do enough, that if it relied upon us doing things for God, there would be no hope at all for us. Just this morning at chapel at Mount Olive, Pastor Molstead, he asked the kids, how many sins do you think you've committed? One especially sinful little girl next to me said, a thousand million. <laughs> she wasn't too far off, I'm sure. She got the point. We are incredibly sinful. 
We should be without hope. We should be totally lost. And then you multiply that number, as Pastor Molstead pointed out, by all the, the people on earth. And what are we, eight billion strong? That is a lot of sin. And we're supposed to make up for all of those sins that we commit? How silly to even think that way. The true God knows the reality of our situation. He realizes how much trouble we are in because of of our sinfulness, of how we have not lived up to his expectations. He knows how hopeless and lost we would be if it were left up to us to jump through all of those hoops, to work ourselves into some sort of relationship with him. And so God devised a different plan. God devised a unique plan where he would be the one who does all of the work. He does it all to pay for your sins. And the Bible is clear about this. It's just some verses that we are very familiar with. Think of John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Or think of Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 8 and 9, and it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's not by our works. No one can boast. Jesus came into this world to be our Savior from sin. He is the one who accomplishes everything that we need. For every single sin to be paid for, He did it. And so it's not about what you do or what I do. It's all about what Jesus has already done by first of all living a holy, perfect life of righteousness. We've sinned. Jesus didn't. He did that for your sake, for mine. Jesus goes to the cross and there he takes the sins of all people of all the world those thousand million of eight billion people and all the rest of the people that have ever existed in world history and will ever exist. He has taken their sins with him to the cross. He has paid for them all in full. And with his resurrection from the dead, he assures us that heaven is in fact now open, prepared, ready for all those who put their trust in him. All of that, All that Jesus has done is now shared with you and with me. It now counts for you and for me as we are baptized. His name, his reputation, his earnings, his credit, it's transferred to you. It now belongs to you. It counts as your own as God pours that water over your head in his name. It's not what our hands have done. It's all about what Jesus has done, what he has accomplished to make us right with God. The power over sin, the power to be righteous in God's eyes, victory over death, possessing eternal life. That all lies in our Savior, Jesus. And he shares it with us in this special gift of baptism. A few moments ago, we heard from 1 Peter chapter 3. And Peter, he really emphasizes that in that section. He doesn't point to things that we do. He points to everything that Jesus did. Everything Jesus did to make us right with God. Peter said, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Peter says, He was put to death and yet made alive in spirit. Peter then goes on to point more to Jesus and say, He he made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. We talk about that when we say the creed. As he descended into hell, Jesus is so victorious that he even gets to descend into enemy territory and say, Look at me, I have won. Peter also points in our text to the resurrection 
of Christ, from his rising from the dead, and also to his ascension to the right hand of God, where he now rules supreme, supreme with all power and glory. Nowhere in that section, nowhere in those verses does Peter point to things that we are supposed to be doing for God. Instead, he's pointing to everything that Jesus has done for us, that now counts for us as God looks at us. And note, in the middle of those verses, in the middle of that section from 1 Peter 3, Peter plainly says, baptism saves you. He's not shifting gears and suddenly in the midst of pointing to Jesus saying, oh, by the way, you have to do this for God. No, he's pointing out that even baptism is how everything about Jesus now flows to you and me. Baptism is far more than some illustration, than some symbolic thing. It's more than just some act of devotion that we are showing to God it is directly connected to our Savior and to everything that he has done for our salvation. Baptism delivers that salvation to you in this concrete, visible, tangible, earthly form that you get to feel and experience yourself. Maybe you don't remember it. I know many were baptized even as little infants, but it happened. It was there. Water was poured upon you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that is comforting. What a treasure that is to you and to me. Because the salvation that Jesus won, we know, in fact, it does belong to me. God has made a good and gracious promise to me, to you, to us individually, personally, and we hold on to that. What does God deliver to you in that water? Well, Peter says, baptism saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. St. Paul also, Pastor Molstead mentioned it at the start in Romans 6, 3. Paul says, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Also, Paul writes to the Galatians, you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You have put Christ upon yourself in baptism. God has put the righteousness, the victory over death, the victory over sin upon you in your baptism. But where does the saving power of baptism come from? Again, it doesn't come from us. Baptism is not something that we are doing. The power source in baptism, according to all of those verses, is in Christ Jesus. If baptism were just a sign, well then, there would be no power in it. But these verses say just the opposite. The power is Christ, and Christ is shared with you and with me in our baptism. Baptism is a powerful washing from God. It is from God to you. It is a powerful impartation of God's forgiveness that's placed upon you. So much more than just some symbol or sign. Now, maybe, uh, maybe someone might look at this and say, hold on, Pastor. Uh, in some of the versions of the Bible... In that section from 1 Peter 3, there's even that word plugged in there that, that it is symbolism. We find symbolism here. Peter says, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. So, hold on. What are we saying? It's not symbolic, but then Peter at the same time in the text, he's saying it is symbolic. But pay careful attention. Peter isn't saying that baptism is symbolic. He is saying that the water, even including the water of the flood that he talks about in the verse before, is a sign, it's a symbol of what baptism does. Baptism itself is not to be understood as being some sign or some symbolic thing, but water should be symbolic for us of our baptism. Baptism is its own thing. It's not just water, but it's water used according to God's command and it's connected 
with his word. God's power isn't found in all water, but he does put his power into that water that is joined with his word and promise when baptism is carried out as he instructed us to do. And what does this baptism actually do and affect in a person then? In those verses uh, in our text, in 1 Peter 3, we hear about the flood. And this picture of the flood is really a picture for us of what takes place in baptism. The water of the flood is symbolic of what happens in reality in our baptism. Water comes rushing in. And in the flood, the water came rushing upon the whole earth, and it wiped out, it destroyed the enemies of God. It cleansed the earth of evil. It was a worldwide cleansing. And meanwhile, for Noah and his family, that water, as they were aboard the ark, it safely lifted them up away from that destruction, away from that, kept them safe. The water of the flood is a symbol of baptism and of what baptism does for you and me. Baptism cleanses and washes away evil and sin in our hearts. And baptism also lifts us up. It preserves us. It saves us from sin, death, and destruction. So when you see water, next time you wash your hands, next time you take a bath or a shower, next time you're washing the dishes or doing laundry, next time you you drive through the car wash, let it be a reminder to you of what God's powerful washing in baptism does for you. Water is a symbol of what God has done for you in your baptism. And thank God for choosing water to connect to baptism. I love the fact that water is the most abundant element here in this world. How much of our earth is covered by water? How much do we depend and rely upon water? It's inescapable. It's so freely available. We need it every day of our lives. And what a beautiful symbol that is then for you and me. A symbol for us that just as abundant and common and inescapable and readily available and needed water is in our in our lives so too is god's love for you he shares it with you he shares his love with you in abundant easily accessible inescapable ways he shares it with you in your baptism and he in fact leaves that faucet running full blast sharing it with you even still, so that every time you and I even remember and recall the fact, I have been baptized. I have been baptized into Christ. His love, his forgiveness, it continues to flow to you and to me. What a precious comfort and treasure this is to us. Knowing that baptism is a sacrament, not a sign. What a blessing God has given to us as he joins his word and his promise to this earthly element that he then delivers to you, and with it he gives you the forgiveness of your sins. As a pastor, I can tell you, this is something that we refer to all the time. There are times when we counsel people or we visit someone, especially when they are struggling, when they're in some season of life, in some pain or hurt. Or even when we ourselves are facing hurt and difficult situations. What a comfort to be reminded of the fact that I have been baptized. You have been baptized. Even though I'm facing this difficult situation, I know that God is still for me. He made an absolute promise to love me. To be here for me. To be working for my good. If that describes you even here and now in whatever season of life you are in, I would urge you, lean into that promise. This is something that we hold before God. When we are feeling distraught, wave before him. I have been baptized. I belong to you. And so I know, God, that you will fulfill your promises that you have made to me. Or for us as pastors, what a... What a precious treasure to remind someone who's on their deathbed about the fact that they have been baptized. To remind them of the fact that they belong to Christ, that forgiveness of sins has absolutely been shared with them. 
that Christ's own righteousness, that his, his suffering and death on the cross, that his victory of death now belongs fully to you who are baptized. And even though your eyelids might be closing in death, you can have every confidence, you who are baptized by God, that your eyes are going to open in the glories of eternal life in God's presence. And also, what a what a wonderful comfort this is to those of us who are left behind, for those of us who, who lose our loved ones, who, who go before us to heaven. We don't lose them. We know where they are, and yet we are sad. But what a comfort knowing that that loved one, that precious one of ours, has been baptized into Christ. That means that even even in the midst of a, of a sorrowful, tragic funeral service, we get to hear and rejoice knowing this is one who is a child of God because they have been baptized. And that means that I, I will see them again in the glories of eternal life. What a precious, powerful gift you and I have from God shared with us in our baptism. Thanks be to Jesus that we have been baptized into his death and that our baptism is a blessed, treasured sacrament, not just a symbol or sign. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.